right, everybody, welcome to Mission Point this morning. So last week was all about the men, and this week is about the women. So we have a woman's choir this morning, and we are going to be talking about the woman at the well, and we're going to be talking about our role as women in the church.
Many of you have been a big part of my life, but didn't know what was going on behind closed doors. Some of you attended my wedding, but what you didn't know is that a few months later, I was being told by my husband that I was no good, I was worthless, and many other things that shouldn't be repeated in church. In 2008, I delivered a precious baby boy. Our church set up a meal train, and when you brought meals to my house, what you didn't know when you delivered those meals is that my body had physical bruises on it from my ex-husband. For three years, my story read as a broken home. I was walking through a storm for seven years, and the story I was telling was a lie. I lied about being physically, verbally, mentally, and emotionally abused. I lied to my friends and family about being divorced. In 2013, all my lives were exposed. And my family and friends stuck beside me while I went through a divorce and fought for the safety of my son. But what's important to know is that God promised to never let me go. He was holding my sorrow, he was holding my heart, and my God doesn't fail. After living all through that, I knew I had to make some changes. Those chapters had to bind me for too long. I realized that I needed to let God dust me off because deep down I knew in my heart that hope is never gone. Just because I was a single mom, it didn't mean I couldn't raise my son in hopes to be a follower of Jesus. In December of 2014, we had a child dedication ceremony. Normally you do this when your child is a baby, but it's never too late to dedicate a child to the Lord. By doing this, I was acknowledging my need for God and my family. I was inviting God to be active in our lives. I was submitting my own desires for my child to God's desires for him. I was making a commitment to raise my son in God's way. And oh boy, did God show up. Five months later, at six years old, Zach accepted Jesus as his personal Lord and Savior in the backseat of my Chevy Cruze. A few months later, he was baptized on Mother's Day. Those days are the high ones, but there are still many low days, and I still have broken parts. But my healing is written in his scars. And I can tell you that when I'm at my weakest, God is there. He shows up by telling someone telling me that they appreciate me. I feel him when my now 15-year-old Zach is singing worship songs at the top of his lungs when he's in the shower. He's with me when I'm in a lawyer's office, and I feel peace because I know that God is writing a story of survival, a story of hope, a story of freedom, a story of healing. So if right now you're feeling no good, weak, addicted, depressed, today is the day to trust in Jesus. I'm not promising life gets easier, but the peace you feel knowing God holds your heart is indescribable.
name is Laura Persons, and this is my story of when I met Jesus at the well. In December of 2009, Matt and I had found out we were expecting our first baby, and we were going in for our first ultrasound um, to see the baby. And we had went in for our appointment, and the doctor was um, looking at the screen and was trying to find the baby's heartbeat. And we noticed that the doctor was very quiet and was not speaking, and we knew something was wrong. And it was at that moment he let us know that our we had lost our baby. And we were just completely devastated. And um, four days before Christmas, we had to, I had to go in for surgery. And it was just a very difficult time for both of us. And we were just struggling. Um, people didn't really understand. Um, some, some people tried to comfort us and it was hard and they didn't really understand how to comfort us because a lot of people hadn't experienced a miscarriage. And I remember being at home and I got a card in the mail and it was from my aunt. And I opened up the card and she was just like, I understand what you're going through. I lost my first baby too. And there was a Bible verse in the card that said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And it was from John 14, 18. And I remember that verse just resonated with me so much during that time. It was, I hung on to that verse. It gave me such great comfort knowing that Jesus was with me. And it also comforted me to know that someone that loved me knew exactly the type of pain I was feeling and experiencing. And I just remember looking at that Bible verse and um, the only proof that I had that my baby existed was a picture of the ultrasound. And I remember having that card and that ultrasound together and I would just look at both of those and just have comfort knowing that Jesus was with me and that one day again, I would be able to see our baby in heaven. And a few months later, a friend from church, she had invited me to come with her to an event that was at another church in this area. And she said it was a women's event, um, and it was a night of healing um, for women who had experienced miscarriage or stillborn or um, for women who had chose um, the choice of abortion. And I remember going to that night um, event with my friend, and I was just dumbfounded that there were so many women that were there that had experienced the loss of a baby. And I found it encouraging to know that I wasn't alone and that other people knew the type of pain that I was going through. And three women spoke that night. One woman spoke on her miscarriage, another one spoke on the stillbirth of her child, and another one spoke of the abortion that she had went through. And all these women had three different stories, but they resonated with me that night. And um, at the end of the event, um, a woman was playing praise and worship music, and they had trays of sand at the altar. And they invited that time for women to come and pray and just leave their burdens and give their burdens to Jesus and to just have that moment with him where they could write down the pain that they were experiencing in the sand and then just wipe it away, just like how um, Jesus wrote in the sand and then he wiped it away. And I remember going down to the altar and writing in the sand and along with many other women, and it was just such encouragement for me and it was a night of healing for me not to to know that I was not alone in this journey and that other women had experienced this pain, but that we could come to our Savior who could give us comfort. And he wasn't going to leave us comfortless, but he was going to give us hope and that my life could um, continue on. And what was amazing is after that, um, after a year after the loss of our baby, we found out we were expecting Hayden. And it was just neat to see how God restored, um, restored me and helped me through my pain. Try to 
Jill Huff, and this is my Meeting Jesus at the Well story. Um, mine comes down to God has always been faithful, even when I wasn't. Um, when I was born, my parents pretty much split right away. 
God was faithful then because my sister and I were placed with my grandparents and they were good, solid, godly people in our lives. They taught us, they raised us in church. I had a very special aunt and uncle who also were very active in our lives and they taught us and they trained us and they always made sure that we knew about God and truly what he could do in our lives. Um, I was six years old when I got saved. It was in front of the basement door on a rainy day at the house that I grew up in. My grandma led me to Jesus. And um, I never doubted that he was there. And even in my wondering, I always knew that what I was doing was wrong. But I never doubted him, if, if that makes any sense. Um, most of my you know, childhood and teen years were in church, going to youth groups and camps and things. Um, as I got into my older high school years, I sort of branched out a little bit and started talking to some people that I probably shouldn't have and doing some things that I shouldn't have, um, looking for something and not realizing what I was looking for, but uh, it led to me having my first son very, very young, just out of high school, um, and sort of living in just a way that was what I thought was supposed to be fun or whatever, but it was empty. Um, I went through some abuse at that point. And as my son got a little bit older and I knew that that was a wrong situation, um, I got back to church, I got back to God. And, you know, again, it was, it was okay for a while. Um, and then I got involved with someone else and you know, things were more peaceful, but church was not necessarily a priority. Um, I had gotten church hurt for, by the church that I grew up in. So we just sort of went through life, not horribly bad, not really great. Um, had some issues with my oldest son growing up, um, some behavioral, some mental health issues with him that was a struggle for a lot of years. Um, there was a lot of, you know, guilt and shame and being overwhelmed. And at one point, it was, I knew I needed to be back in church. So we all got back in church and it was okay for a while, but then there was problems in that marriage and church hurt again. And by this point I have another child and it's just, life was so crazy and chaotic. And I walked away again. Um, proceeded to live life, just live life, go to work, do whatever, hang out with people. There was time spent in bars. There was um, time spent with people that was absolutely a waste of time. There was a lot of chaos and no real center. And it just got really, really old. And I was so tired. And we had been through so many struggles. And finally, it got to a point, really, when I was expecting my youngest, Eden, with, with my current husband, that I just knew I was done. I couldn't do it anymore. And I knew because of where I came from. I knew that God was the only one that could fix it. And we were brought to Mission Point. It was Cochran Baptist. And we came here at the time because my son Jonah's buddy River went here to youth group and wanted him to come. And this is absolutely where we were supposed to be because God has given me such a gift with 
good friends that I can talk to about anything, and they have been so supportive. And I learned early on when we were here that I just had to Abraham my kids to God. And I'm so thankful that I learned that lesson when we were first here because we had some restoration with my oldest son and we had six good years where things were, were, were going well. And he was here and, you know, Eden was coming up here and God gifted me relationships because he knew that sometimes things aren't always as we think they are or we would like them to continue. Um, we are back in a season of trouble with my oldest and it has been hard. But God has been so faithful every time that I'm having a day that I think I can't take one more minute. There is somebody, there is a sweet lady that says, we are still praying for you. I have some good friends here that I know I could text them any time, day or night, and say, please pray, and they are on it. God has given me good co-workers who also pray for me, and, and they ask me how things are going, and they give me good godly advice. It may be God just giving me a song on the radio when I get in, and it's just the right one, right when I need to hear it. And he has given me such peace in my life that I was looking for something in the whirlwind and the thunder and the earthquake. And when I just stopped and listened for his whisper, that was where he took care of me. Mm. Amen. Children, you are dismissed. Open your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. We want you to know that Jesus can heal anything. Amen? Jesus is the one we cling to. Jesus is the one that fulfills. Jesus is the one that helps us through all of life's struggles. That's why when you come to Jesus, you need to be Jesus to lost, broken people. That's who they need to see. And so this is Focus on the Family Month, and we have been talking about the roles of a husband last week, and we get to the role of a wife today. And we see there are so many women that are broken, so many women that, that need help. And that's what we should be. We should be help. We should be helping people. You know, when you follow God's design, it's not that you're going to fix other people. It's that you're going to be able to react how God wants you to react. And he will always be there to help you through all those tough times. And it's in those times that we represent Jesus to people that have no hope. And when we talk about a woman's role in a marriage, and so it begins in the home. These things begin in the home, and so our culture is so destroyed because our homes are destroyed. Because they have not seen a godly example that they should. And so... People look to the church, and when the church not performing what it's supposed to be doing, then the world doesn't see what it's supposed to, to have any kind of idea of who Jesus is. So when we talk about the role of a wife, this is not to degrade a woman. This is not to put her down. Because let me tell you, man, if you're not doing your job, she'll never be able to fulfill her role that God has expected her to be. And so as we come to this, it started out in creation in Genesis 1, 27. Uh, Moses wrote, God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created them, male and female. He created them. Can I tell you something? God did not create men 
and more of his creation than he did women. Men and women were created both equal in the image of God. Amen? It's the equality of the sexes. They're, they're both created in the image of God. Both of them 100% in the image of God. And so this is uh, um, something that people forget. But in Genesis chapter 2, we see that God created differences in men and women. We have differences in function and differences in responsibility. And I think when we don't understand how God created things and why he created them, God created man first. He did not create him at the same time. Man was created first. God gave man a job. <laughs> we talked about this last week. Ladies, if you're going to look for a man, make sure he's first got a job. <laughs> That's what God did. He gave him a job first so that he could support his family. And so he began to name the animals and tend to keep the garden. And then he took a woman and he made her. Because he said, this is the only thing in the Garden of Eden that was not good, is that man be alone. And so we see Adam naming the animals, and here's this animal, male and female, here's this animal, male and female, here's this animal, male and female, but there was none for him. There was not, so God said, I will make a help meet. That's a different word than a help mate. Somebody who is equal to him. And that's how God created. Women and men were equal. And in the eyes of the Lord, they are still equal today, spiritually. Galatians 3.28. God says there's neither uh, Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free, nor male or female, for we are all one in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. But I want you to understand one thing. Headship and submission were actually part of God's creative design. People don't understand this. In 1 Corinthians chapter three, uh, 11, verse 3 Paul says that, I want you to understand, the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. So here you see an order of authority, not dominating, uh, lording over, but you see God's creative design of authority. So it's God the Father, who is head of Jesus Christ, who is head of the man, who is head of the woman. That's the authoritative um, design. God created everything in the beginning, and the word headship or kephale in the Greek, everywhere where it's used in relation to relationships, it always means authority. And so since God created Adam, he is the authority over mankind. And even though Eve sinned first, it was him that resulted in the fall because he was the authority. I mean, you can go back and forth in the garden. She ate first and so forth. But here's the thing. She gave to her husband because he was right there. Why did he not protect her and keep her safe? Um, so it's just as much his fault as it was hers in the beginning. But there were consequences to that. And so this is where we, this is where we, we have. Our consequences because man sinned, woman sinned. God said, now there's going to be some problems. God created the authority of man over the woman, and she is to willfully submit herself to his authority. But what happened was when sin came into the world, that destroyed God's creative design. And now you have the loving headship of the husband over the woman is gone. Now you have to struggle to love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave his life for her. Because of sin. Now we have a sinful nature. Amen? Now you got hindrances against you already. And so either men have this dominance over the women, this, this uh, abusive type of I'm in charge and you better submit to me attitude, or they have this lazy indifference and they don't want to step up and lead their home like they should. And what that has done is that has... In our Christian culture today, the main problem is that we have women with, with broken hearts, and, and they have broken stories. They have woman at the well stories, because men don't lead them like they should and take the initiative to love them as Christ loved the church and gave his life for her. And so we see this design in Ephesians 5. It's supposed to redirect us back, uh, especially... Um, back to the Eden design where 
Uh, this equality was there, but the man was the head, and she willfully submitted. And, and so, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, Peter says, Likewise, husbands are to live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, nothing more than physical uh, weakness, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. Now, we talk about heirs being joint heirs with Jesus in eternal life, and that's true, and I think we interpret this verse as being um, talking about two saved spouses are going to enjoy eternal life, not only here they're going to enjoy, but also in eternity. But in the context of this verse, 1 Peter chapter 3 is talking about a saved spouse and an unsaved spouse. And so uh, I do believe that also um, what it's talking in this context, it's talking about the grace of life. That's marriage. God had created marriage in the garden, and it was supposed to be something that's to be the grace of life. There's to be something that you're not good to be alone. So God created people to be together. It's togetherness. It's fellowship. You pick people up. That's what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes. It's better that that two or three walk together, because if you fall in a hole, somebody can help you out. That's what we're here to be. We're here to be a help to one another, not a hindrance. But sin has destroyed a lot of those things. And so life is supposed to be something that's supposed to be enjoyable. And so we struggle with the sin nature and to find purpose and meaning and hope. I saw this. It said, a woman was made from the rib of man, not from his head to top him, nor his foot to be stepped on by him, but from his side to be equal to him, under his arm, to be protected by him, and near his heart, to be loved by him. Tim Bongiorno, would you open in a word of prayer? We'll get into our study this morning in Ephesians 5. Amen. Now, let me give you five quick principles. Be in the next two and a half hours and we'll be done. Number one, this is always an ugly word. Wives, be submissive. Oh, here we go. Talking about that word submissive again. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, Paul says this. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Oh, Pastor Dan, you know that word submit is in italics. You know what happens when a word's in italics in the Bible, right? wasn't part of the original. So you've just added that. I was like, well, that, that's true. <laughs> I'm sorry. Every word in your translation in the English that's italicized was not in the riddle, original. It was added. But here's the problem. That word there, submit, comes from the Greek word hupotasso. And it, it's a military term. And it means to willfully place yourself under authority. And so it's used as to the Lord. When I submitted in salvation to the Lord Jesus, when I committed my life to him, I am submitting myself willfully under his authority to everything that I am and everything that he has created me to be. You don't just submit something, Lord, I'm going to submit my salvation so I can have eternal life to you, but I'm going to go live how I want. It doesn't work that way. You do that in the military. You sign up for the military, and then you tell them what you're going to do and see how far you get. (laughs) I found that when I signed up. Yeah, I'm not going in on that date. Yes, you will, or we'll come get you. I'm going to go away on the weekend. Nope, you're not going more than five miles from the base. What? I I can't leave? Yep, if you do, you'll be AWOL. We'll arrest you. I don't belong to me? Nope, you're government issued. That's what GI stands for. Like, wow. When you commit yourself, it's 100%. And so for a woman, it's not the fact that men are saying, you need to submit. You need to submit. There's a reason for this. It's willful submission. And men, if you're not performing your role, a woman will never submit to your authority because you don't look like Jesus. Amen? But women, it's important for you to submit to that authority because it's God's creative design. And I don't need this verse because there's many more. Matter of fact, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 18, it says, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. And that word is in the original. That's why it's not an italicized. 
And so it goes on, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, same thing. Likewise, wives, be subject. Same word, hupatasso. That's what we get, submit. Be submissive to your own husbands. And Titus chapter 2, verse 3 through 5, talks about the older women. You are to teach what is good. Train young women to love their husbands, love their children. Be self-controlled, be pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands. We're to train people up that way. Why? There's a big reason for it, a huge reason why God says, submit to the authority that I have designed. And that's found in Titus 2, verse 5. Submissive to the, train them to be submissive to their husbands that the word of God may not be dishonored. It's not your husband. Your husband may not lead you like you should. He may be dominant over you, or he may just be lazy and doesn't want to lead like he's called to. But here's the thing. If you're not submitting to God's authority, it's not submitting to him. It's submitting to God's authority. And by not doing that, you're dishonoring the word of God. That's the importance. That's what I'm saying. When you undermine the scripture, what you're saying is that not all of the Bible matters. Not all of the Bible matters. So if you can pick and choose what matters, then you can pick and choose what you want to reject. Amen? Then why listen to the word of God? Right? And if you're going to pick and choose, all you're going to do is just dishonor the word. We need to, we need to be submissive. Why? Why? It shows unity. It shows unity and conformity to obedience to God. We're all called to be uh, submissive in a, uh, a way. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 16. Paul says, be subject, submissive, hupotasso, same word, to such as these, to every fellow worker in labor. It's talking about people that labor in the kingdom of God, that labor in ministry, that are laboring. We're to submit to one another. Hebrews 13, 17, obey uh, your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls. It's talking about the pastors and the elders and the leaders in the church. They're watching out for what being taught here, what is being spoken here, and you're submit to them. This is why it's important for people to be a member of a church. You'll never find membership in your Bible, but this is why it's so important for you to be a member. It's because you're submitting to God's authority. Amen? I hear people all the time, I don't have to come to church. I don't have to go view hypocrites. Well, we got room for one more hypocrite. Come on. We got plenty of chairs. But the idea is that we need to submit to God. That's why we're here. We're sinners. We have the sin nature, and we still have to work on each other. That's why we have submission. We're being obedient to God's commands. First Peter chapter 2, verse 13 says, You're to be subject to, uh, for the Lord's sake, every human institution. Whether it's the emperor or supreme, be subject to your government. I mean, we're just, submission is in just about everything. And so, matter of fact, when the wife, if the wife is saved and the husband is unsaved, your submission to his authority by God in God's creative design might win him to the Lord. First Peter chapter 3, verse 1, that's what he goes on to say. It says... Um, Wives, uh, likewise, your wives are to be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, that just means that they're unsaved. If they don't obey the word, that they may be won without saying a word by your conduct, and that they see your respectful conduct. Man, to be submissive to God's design, when you're obedient to God's design, He will bless that. Amen? It, it, it's important. But like we said with men, Men don't want to lead. Either they dominate over the women or they're too lazy to show any kind of initiative. You have the sin nature. And the same thing holds true for a woman. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, Moses writes, Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. It's the same idea in Genesis chapter 4 when God is talking to Cain. Because Cain's countenance is fallen. He is getting mad. He's getting angry with his brother. And God says, Why is your countenance fallen? He says, sin is desiring to be right at your door, man. He wants to rule over you, but you have to rule over it. It's hard. It goes against our sinful nature. 
Men don't want to lead because of their sinful nature. Or they want to dominate because that's a sinful nature. That's the struggle that Paul says in Galatians 5, 16 and 17. The flesh struggles with the spirit. And it's a moment by moment basis. And the women do the same thing. God designed the man to be the head. And so she wants to rule. That's part of the sinful nature. But here's the idea. Sin makes it struggling for women to submit to their husbands. And so we need more people to follow God's design. It's going to show this world something different. Number two, not only are women to be submissive willfully, but number two, they've got to be truthful, trustworthy. Uh, Proverbs chapter 31, verse 11 to 12 says, The heart of her husband trusts her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. Finding a good woman who's trustworthy, that's great. When you find her, she'll be trustworthy with your money, with your children, with your possessions, with your reputation, with her purity, with her character, and everything that she does for you, it'll be good for you all the days of your life. That's amazing. This is the Proverbs 31 woman, that godly woman, that excellent woman who who can find her. Number three, yep, moving on. Number three, wives, pursue your husbands, pursue them. Not other things, not your children. Pursue your husbands. In Psalm chapter uh, 128, verse 3, it says, Your wife will be like a fruitful vine without, uh, within your house. And so the house represents the husband, and so there's like a vine growing on it. It's all attached. It's clinging to the house. And that's the idea. Women cling to your husbands. Pursue him. Help him be the better person in Christ. That's what God's design is. A wife's job is to help them be a better person in Christ. And the husband's job is to help them be a better woman in Jesus. You pull them each other to look more like Jesus. And when you do that, you'll be following God's design. Things won't be perfect. Because Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, 28, in this life, in marriage, you're going to have worldly troubles. But if you're following Jesus, it's how you respond is going to be the best. It's going to cause less problems, and you'll have more uh, conflict resolution. Number four, honor him. Respect him. Man, this is the biggest, and I don't mean to be mean, but Ephesians 5, verse 33, it says this. Let each of you love his wife as himself and see that the wife, that she respects her husband. In Proverbs 31, verse 23, talking about the same thing, he says, Her husband is known in the gates when he sits down uh, by the elders of the land. And this speaks of how she respects and honors her husband by the way she acts, by the way she speaks, by what she does when he's around, and even when he's not around. This is the biggest way that women can degrade men is by tearing them down and not respecting them. When God made a woman, he took her from the rib of man And one function of the rib is to protect the heart. In the same way, women should protect her man's heart. And be careful not to use words that are going to be hurting. Can I be open and honest and biblical? Don't shoot the messenger. And Proverbs 27, verse 15, the NLT says it this way. A nagging wife is as annoying as a constant dripping on a rainy day. And trying to stop her complaints is like trying to stop the wind or trying to hold something with greased hands. The, ouch. I, I mean, listen, Proverbs 21, 19 says this. It's better to live in a desert land than with a nagging and a fretful wife. Uh, Proverbs 21, oh, I'm full of them, man, T- trust me. <laughs> Proverbs, <laughs> this, <clears throat> just one more, we'll just one more. Proverbs 21, verse 9. The TLB says it this way. The Living Bible says this. It's better to live in the corner of an attic than with a crabby woman in a lovely home. I don't care how awesome your house looks. If you have a crabby woman in there, it'd be better for you up in the attic living with the spiders. I know. (laughs) You got to lighten this up, man. But, uh, But seriously... Dr. Irv Wolf, we talked about this last week. Men are looking for significance, and they need to find it in their wives. Their wives need to give them significance, just like a wife is looking for safety and security, and they find that in the husband. 
The same thing holds true with the wife. He needs to find significance, and it comes from her. Man, if you're not building your husband up, you're tearing him down. One of the two. There's no middle ground. Amen? I got to get off of that one because that was just moving on. Number five. Tom? Number five. This is the last one. Fear the Lord. Listen, the Bible has so much to say about husbands' roles and men's and wives' roles and children's roles and parenting and grandparenting. We can't get to them all. I'm just hitting a few of them. But fear the Lord. This is most important. Proverbs 31 30 says this Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. That's awesome. If she is going to put the Lord first and her husband second, then the rest of these principles will follow automatically. The Lord first and her husband second, all these principles will follow automatically. Submitting to his authority has nothing to do with doing things unbiblical. In Acts chapter 5, verse 29, Peter and the apostles said, we obey God rather than men. Let me tell you something. I'm not going to get into this. Um, You had a beautiful testimony from Miss Tiffany Winters. The Bible says that you are not to stay with anybody who is verbally or physically abusive. You understand? The Bible says anybody who is verbally or physically abusive, you separate from them. Matter of fact, the Bible says mark them. This, it doesn't just go for in the home. It goes for the church. Anybody is verbally or physically abusive, you mark them and have nothing to do with them. Now, when it's in a marriage, you don't want to be separated too long. You want to make sure that they're working on themselves so that you can come back together. Uh, the Bible does talk about that. But I'm telling you, that's why we submit to one another. That's why we weep with one another. That's why we rejoice with one another and we help one another. We're here to be a help, not a hindrance. This world is broken, and so is the church. We've got so much against us, but we need to be giving people Jesus. It needs to be lived out in our lives. And so so we finish in Proverbs 31 with the, the, the perfect woman. Is there something like that perfect woman? Amen. You all got the perfect woman. If you all got the perfect woman, then there's not just one. But here's the idea. It starts where it finishes. It finishes where it started. Proverbs 1, uh, verse 7, Solomon says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The Living Bible says it this way. How does a person become wise? Well, the first step is to trust and reverence the Lord. Only fools refuse to be taught. We're to follow God's design. Why is it following God's design? Because as Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, The NASB says it this way, godliness is beneficial for all things. If you are following God's design, you are following God's plan, that'll benefit you in every area and aspect of life, whether a child, in school, in sports, with friends, marriage, husbands, wives, child rearing, grandparenting, relationships at work, does not matter. The Bible has so much to say about every aspect of it. And if you are following God's plan, it'll be beneficial for all things. Let me just bring this to a close here real quick. You'll never be able to do that unless you're filled with the Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 through 21, Paul says, be filled with the Spirit. Giving thanks always for everything to God the Father and uh, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Verse 22, wives, submit to your own husband. Okay, so everything comes out of being filled with the Spirit. If you're not filled with the Spirit, you'll never be able to love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave his life for her. And wives, if you're not filled with the Spirit, you'll never be able to submit to his authority. This is something very serious that God has given us. And I'll say this, and we'll close. Friend, you'll never be the husband or the wife that God intended you to be unless you have the Spirit of God. That's the help that we need. And you need to be born of the Spirit. Jesus says in John chapter 3, verse 3, he's talking to Nicodemus. He said, unless you are born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. Unless you are born into the kingdom of God, you can't live in the kingdom and put these practices into play. You need the Spirit of God to apply it to be filled with the Spirit. 
Have you been born again? Have you been saved? Has there ever been a time where you confess and recognize your sinfulness and place your faith and trust in a commitment to Jesus Christ? I encourage you to do that today.